The tree stood off one corner of Cambridge Common, and eventually the Washington Elm stood on what we now call a traffic island at the junction of Garden and Mason Streets, protected by an iron fence and held up by iron rods. Meanwhile, the elm itself was shrinking as it grew old and its limbs fell off. Uh, that's not the uh, Since the el tree had become famous, people took seedlings and turned the wood into souvenirs of various sorts, as we see on the other table. So today, the Washington elm lives on in many forms and in memory. But how did its story begin? This is Edward Everett, one of America's greatest 19th century orators. He is most famous now for giving the two-hour oration opening the Gettysburg National Cemetery that nobody cares about. <laughs> Everett served Massachusetts as a representative, a senator, and governor. He was U.S. Minister to Britain. He was U.S. Secretary of State. And of course, for here in Cambridge, the, his most prestigious post was President of Harvard College from 1846 to 1848. Soon after becoming a member of Congress, Everett was invited to deliver an oration in Cambridge on the 4th of July in 1826. And he told the crowd how fortunate to, they were to be right where they were in Cambridge uh, uh, 51 years after Washington arrived. He said, here the first American army was formed beneath the venerable elm which still shades the southwestern corner of the common. General Washington first unsheathed his sword at the head of an American army. And to that seat, Everett said, pointing to a particular <coughs> pew in the meeting house, he was wont every Sunday to repair, to join in the supplications which were made for the welfare of his country. Now, in fact, the evidence shows that Washington went to that meeting house once, not every Sunday. But he did go there. He did sit, presumably, in that pew. In speaking about when Washington first unsheathed his sword at the head of an American army, Everett was invoking an iconic moment in the national memory of the Revolution. Uh, this is an engraved portrait of George Washington made by Elkanah Tisdale and published in 1797. And at the bottom, and here's a close-up, we can see an inset picture labeled, General Washington takes command of the American army at Cambridge, July 3rd, 1775. Already that's a legendary version of the story. He had arrived the day before, July 2nd. That's when he took command. Notice how, furthermore, how all the soldiers on the left side are lined up in uniform ranks with flags. Most of the Continental Army didn't have uniforms at that point. Uh, you, you may also notice that in Tisdale's version, 1797, there is no tree. The elm had not become a crucial part of the scene. But Everett's oration, which was frequently reprinted in the 19th century, was the first step to making this tree famous. The next step came from this man, John Langdon Sibley. In 1837, he was a former minister living in Cambridge and editing the American Magazine of Useful and Entertaining Knowledge. <laughs> and he wrote an article titled, The Washington Elm, which came with a picture. And the, that article stated, The Washington Elm stands in the westerly corner of the large common near Harvard University in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and is probably one of the trees that belong to the native forest. In other words, the tree was so old that it predated English settlements in the colony of Massachusetts Bay. And so went on, the revolutionary soldiers who stood shoulder to shoulder, blessings be on their heads, tell us that when Washington arrived at Cambridge, he drew his sword as commander-in-chief of the American army for the first time beneath its boughs, and resolved within himself that it should never be sheathed till the liberties of his country were established. Uh, Sibley went on to be the Harvard University librarian for decades. Other authors also spread the news about the elm in Cambridge. On July 4th, 1842, the Reverend Charles W. Upham of Salem wrote of, of how, reining his war, up his war horse beneath the majestic and venerable elm still standing at the entrance of the old Watertown Road upon the Cambridge Common, George Washington unsheathed his sword and assumed the command of the gathering armies of American liberty. And that passage would show up in many school textbooks over the next several decades. <clears throat> this is the popular poet Olivia Huntley Sigourney. In 1845, she published a poem titled The Washington Elm in Cambridge, Massachusetts. It not only picked up the name of that tree from John Langdon Sibley's article, but also the idea that it had been around since before the pilgrims arrived. And that at least in poetry, it could bear witness to historic moments. Because Sigourney was writing in the voice of the tree. <laughs> 
I heard the bleak December tempest moan when toss the tossed Mayflower moored in Clement Bay, and watched young classic walls as stone by stone the fathers reared them slowly toward the day. But lo, a mighty chieftain neath my shade drew his bright sword and reared his dauntless head, and Liberty sprang forth from rock and glade and donned her helmet for, for the hour of dread. Sigourney's book also offered a historical essay on the elm, and both the psalm and the essay were picked up in Joshua Levitt's selections for reading and speaking for the higher classes in the common schools in 1850. Now, when statements about history get into the textbooks, when young people grow up being taught to memorize certain facts or certain language, certain poetry, it becomes very important. It gets deep roots in our culture. They believe those. We, we feel those very strongly. Well, why would we go to all that trouble of remembering them? Why were we tested on them? They become part of how we see our country. In 1846, the story of the elm looped back to Edward Everett. This was the year he became president of Harvard, and he also designed a seal for the city of Cambridge. And in that seal, Everett included the Washington elm alongside a college building. Gore Hall. Gore Hall, Library. no longer there, uh, but uh, named after the uh, uh, Governor Gore who gave the money for it. Uh, I happen to like the Gore family. Uh, in that seal, there's the Washington Elm. As, now, as Thomas Campanella discusses in his book, Republic of Shade, New England and the American Elm, those images had particular appeal in the middle of the 19th century because Cambridge was no longer a rural town. Or it was an industrial city with a growing immigrant population. Streets were getting wider. Stands of trees were being cut down. Just and when the growing United States of America was looking for deeper roots in its past, it was uprooting ancient woodlands. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow was part of the movement to create an independent American culture, even if it meant conjuring up new legends. And where did authors like Longfellow create those legends from? From history books and from the landscape. This is the forest primeval, begins Evangeline. The Song of Hiawatha tells the stories come from the forest and the prairies. This is when people were founding wooded cemeteries like Mount Auburn. The common, which was originally a place where you put your cow out to graze, or your sheep, now it was a public park. It was a way for people living in the city to connect back with nature. Trees became more important symbolically as they became less common and less part of practical everyday life. And we can see people actually look, going to look at this tree. In 1848, a law student named Daniel Richardson Bigelow, this is not him as a law student, but many years later, <laughs> he was sightseeing in Cambridge, and he described the elm this way. It is a venerable tree. Its branches extend almost to the side of the street on each side. He was already in the middle of the street. It is yet vigorous and thriving. It is surrounded with a railing of iron and preserved with great care. So this was no longer a natural tree. This is actually a tree uh, with a man-made artificial barrier to protect it. Bigelow also said that he met with an old man who showed with much satisfaction where Washington stood and where the army was. He said that he, the army was drawn up on parade. Uh, now, that man told Bigelow he had seen Washington when he take the command of the army when he was 12 years old, meaning that he had to be 85 if he had actually seen it. Another sightseer was the journalist and artist Benson Lossing. He wrote about the Washington Elm, still putting that phrase in quotation marks at first, for Harper's Magazine in 1850. One of the ancient anakim of the primeval forest, older probably by a half century or more than the welcome of Samoset to the white settlers. Again, we hear about the tree being older than New England itself. And Lossing linked the tree to the ancient forest, even though the picture in his book clearly showed it in the middle of the road. <laughs> and that's why we needed that iron fence, because wagons would uh, come pretty close to the trunk. Lossing later wrote about the house in the background of his sketch. I've been informed that a Mrs. Moore was still living there, who, from the window of that house, saw the ceremony of Washington taking command of the army. In fact, Josiah Moore and his family didn't move into that house until several years after 1775. But that ceremony was what Americans wanted to picture. Gradually, an authors and illustrators began to increase the number of troops involved in the ceremony, if not explicitly, then implicitly. 
In, by 1864, Benjamin Franklin Morris thought that it was credible for a Continental Army chaplain to describe how Washington drew his sword and formally took command of the army of 17,000 men. Maybe not all on the common, but it was still, the implication was there. And other stories came up about the Washington Elm. In, 1770, in July 1846, an article appeared in the Boston newspapers <coughs> citing the authority of the Reverend Daniel Waldo, one of the last living veterans of the Continental Army. He is one of the like dozen or so soldiers uh, who lived long enough to be photographed. He, Waldo stated that Washington, on the day that he assumed the command of the American Army at Cambridge, read and caused to be sung the 101st Psalm to the tune of Old Hundred. <laughs> In 1775, Waldo was only 12 years old and many miles from Cambridge, so he was relying on stories he had heard from other people. And, but over the following decades, we know that a couple of other soldiers were said by their descendants to have told similar stories. One man, Joseph Wallace, reportedly said that George General Washington actually led the singing of the Old Hundred. <laughs> Another, Andrew Levitt, said that at the end of the ceremony, Washington sat under the tree and read the psalm to the soldiers from his own psalm book. <laughs> now, both those soldiers were from the same corner of, of New Hampshire. They were veterans of the Revolutionary War. However, their units were actually stationed out on Winter Hill at that time. Uh, more important, everybody who ever spent time with Washington knew that he was not very demonstrative in his worship. <laughs> with what those soldiers described might have fit other top officers in the American army, like General Artemis Ward, who was a church deacon back home in Shrewsbury, but not Washington. Those pious tales reflected how some Americans wanted to picture Washington. And that image remained popular. Harriet Beecher Stowe retold that story in 1872, although she was careful enough to put it in the voice of a revolutionary veteran. By the time of the US Civil War, the Washington Elm was nas a nationally known symbol of American patriotism. But it was also literally rooted in New England. And that became significant when the region marched towards war for the first time in decades. For a military heritage, New Englanders had to look all the way back to the Revolution. The War of 1812 was very unpopular in this region, so much so that it actually uh, caused calls to leave the Union. The Mexican-American War was seen as a war to expand the slave power in the South. So to evoke a local military tradition, New England authors invoked our memories of the Revolution. This was the same impulse that prompted Longfellow to write Paul Revere's Ride in 1860. And in 1861, after the Confederate attack on Fort Sumter in Charleston Harbor, men gathered around the Washington Elm. The Cambridge Chronicle reported the venerable elm was decorated with ancient regimental standards and a shield of liberty and draped with flags. And then on April 19th, US troops on their way to guard Washington, DC, passed through Baltimore. And pro-Confederate crowds attacked those men, throwing stones. And the eventual riot left four Massachusetts soldiers and 12 locals died, dead. Eight days later, Dr. Oliver Wendell Holmes responded in poetry. Now, Holmes was born in 1809 in a house beside the Cambridge Common, not on the same side where the elm stood, but across so that he, could, he would have had a sight of it as a boy. Holmes was one of Longfellow's friends and colleagues. And that month, his own son, Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr., enlisted in the US Army to fight the rebellion. So the coming war was deeply personal to that, Dr. Holmes. He penned a poem titled, Under the Washington Elm, Cambridge, April 27th, 1861. And he evoked the events of April 19th, 1775. 80 years have passed and more since under that brave old tree, our fathers gathered in arms and swore they would follow the sign their banners bore and fight till the land was free. Half of their work was done, half is left to do. Cambridge and Concord and Lexington, when the battle is fought and won, what shall be told of you? Then when the battle is won, and the land from the traitors free, our children shall tell of the strife begun when liberty's second April sun was bright on our brave old tree. Holmes never mentioned Washington in this poem, except in that title phrase, Washington Elm. But everybody knew what the Washington Elm was, what it symbolized. Holmes was emphasizing our fathers, the collective community of Cambridge or of Massachusetts, fighting a new war. And he built a new story on those old memories. 
1864, the city of Cambridge honored the tree by installing a granite monument on it at its side to proclaim its place in the nation's history. And this was, as I say, just when the nation was in the middle of a very big, very deadly fight about the meaning of that history. According to a tradition reported only later in 1884, the person who composed the words on that monument was Henry Wadsworth Longdon. Now, I can't say it's his best work. It says just, <laughs> under this tree, Washington first took command of the American army, July 30, 1775. Longfellow also, I'm oh, sorry, July 3rd, Longfellow also lobbied the mayor of Cambridge to preserve another elm, one that stood a few rods away from the Washington elm. It was called the Whitefield Elm, because the Reverend George Whitefield had reportedly preached under it in 1740 when he wasn't allowed in the Cambridge Meeting House. And despite some people's wishes to save that tree, it fell in 1872. And Longfellow wrote in his diary, Cambridge has an ill renown for destroying trees. <laughs> he did his best to preserve the town's historical horticulture. In, in 1871, he had a seedling from the Washington Elm transplanted onto his property here. And in, uh, he preserved it in other ways as well. In March 1875, the city forester brought Longfellow some items made from branches that had been pr pruned off that old elm. In particular, the Longfellows used cross sections of the elm under their bust of George Washington to make sure that his eyes were at the right height. And this cup was also said to have been made from a scrap of the Washington elm. By this point, the tree had become a celebrity. It was pampered, it was protected, and everyone wanted a piece of it. The tree's legend also continued to grow. My favorite example is an unsourced claim that Samuel Adams Drake inserted into his book, Historic Fields and Madisons of Middlesex, first published in 1874. When the camp was here, Washington caused a platform to be built along the branches of the tree, where he was accustomed to sit and survey with his glass the country round. <laughs> I have never found that detail reported in any other country. I've never seen any pictures of Washington, General Washington, in his treehouse. Which suggests that Drake's story, although it had no more and no less uh, backing than many of the other stories, just didn't fit the idea of General Washington that people, that Americans wanted to believe in. The year, that year, 1875, was the start of America's centennial, just as the next year will be the start of our sister centennial, or semi quin centennial. Uh, Courier and Ives released this lithograph in 1876, Washington taking control of the American army at Cambridge, July 1775. And like the 1797 engraving I started with, it shows ranks of soldiers drawn up for review, equipped with uniforms, flags, tents. But now there are even more ranks, and towering over the scene on the left is the Washington Elm. This is sort of the uh, canonization of this scene in American culture. Cambridge planned a big public celebration on July 3rd of 1775, which had become now the standard anniversary for when Washington took command. It's made me hard to see with this, but there is an actual statue of Washington, temporary statue of Washington, erected in front of the tree. And of course, the focus of that celebration was the Washington Elm. The city invented, invited local poet, James Russell Lowell to compose and deliver an ode on the occasion. Lowell wrote to my friend, since my friend and townsman Dr. Holmes couldn't be had, I felt bound to do all the poetry for the day. And Lowell made sure there was a lot of poetry. He wrote a very long poem titled called Under the Old Elm. He didn't even get to General Washington taking command until the third section of that poem. Uh, and I'm only going to read a bit of it, but uh, here's how Lowell first described, starting with the soldiers. Our rude self-summoned levies flock to see the new-come chiefs and wonder which was he. No need to question long, close-lipped and tall, long-trained in murder-brooding forests, lone to bridle others' clamors and his own. Firmly erect, he towered above them all to the incarnate discipline that was to free with iron curb that armed in democracy. Lowell expected his audience to recognize his allusion to Washington without even needing to hear the general's name. He emphasized, he actually emphasized how the soldiers didn't wear uniforms, using that detail to depict them as serious drills to spare, skilled to debate their orders, not obey. I mean, it wasn't a real army. Until 
Washington arrived. The politics of Lowell's poem are not subtle. Washington had come to keep an iron curb on the locals' armed democracy. Another political message appears in the poem's final line praising Virginia, mother of states and unpolluted men. Lowell welcomed the Confederate state back into the U.S. of A. at the end of Reconstruction. It reflected the idea of national reconciliation at the expense of equal rights. Uh, in the background of this scene of the Washington uh, Elm from Scribner's Magazine in 1876, you can see Harvard's Memorial Hall, which was a new monument to the Union mm -hmm. dead. The memory of the Civil War was going to cast a shadow over all of American culture in the late 1800s. The last, that last quarter of the 19th century was the period of the colonial revival, when stories and artifacts of the revolution carried a sort of nationalistic religion based as much on faith as on evidence. By 1900, New England Magazine would call the Washington Elm perhaps the best known of all living American trees. But the tree the elm itself was being hemmed in, stranded in the middle of a road with a streetcar running past it. <laughs> the 20th century brought also, as the 20th century came, the colonial revival faded out and there was a more skeptical approach to writing history, a more scientific approach. Authors began to look askance on stories based only on tradition, and the word debunking was coined. In 1921, Charles Martin published The Life of Artemis Ward, a biography of the man who commanded the uh, New England Army until Washington arrived. Martin studied General Ward's orders books, which reported the arrival of the new commander-in-chief in Cambridge on the rainy afternoon of July 2nd. That was the date when Washington formally became the new commander. Maybe Washington uh, reviewed his new army the next day, but Ward has no mention of summoning lots of American soldiers to Cambridge Common to, for a ceremonial handover. Martin also looked at soldiers' diaries. He found nine that mentioned Washington's arrival, but none described him taking command in a public ceremony on Cambridge Common. Furthermore, Martin noted four diaries specifically testified that on July 3rd there happened nothing new, or nothing remarkable, or nothing extraordinary. Here's another piece of evidence from 1775. On July 4th, General Nathaniel Green wrote in a letter, I sent a detachment today of 200 men, commanded by a colonel, lieutenant colonel, and major, with a letter of address to welcome His Excellency to camp. That letter meant that as of July 4th, Green himself still hadn't met Washington. Washington still hadn't re 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 reviewed most of the Rhode Island troops. And he was, Green sent 200 men, which was less than one regiment. Although and 200 men with a nicely worded letter was thought to be a sufficient welcome to the new commander. Uh, so it wasn't a big ceremony. This was about as big as it gets. Uh, in fact, in sending such a delegation at all, Green comes off as a bit of a suck-up, uh, which could be one reason why Washington liked him so much. Uh, however, Charles Martin relegated his argument about the Washington Elm tradition to having no contemporaneous support to a footnote. In the popular histories, the guidebooks, the school books, the legends still st stood tall. In real life, as in this photo from 1921, the tree was in terrible shape. The city arborists had had to remove more limbs. The trunk was wrapped with zinc bands. The branches held up with iron rods. And then the tree collapsed. <laughs> In his essay, The Washington Elm Tradition, Samuel F. Batchelder wrote, finally, on October 26th, 1923, the whole wretched ruin was accidentally pulled over by workmen trying to remove another dead branch <laughs> and crashed against the iron railing surrounding it. Examination showed that the trunk was hopelessly rotted below the ground, a mere mass of punk. The wonder was that it had stood for so long. The people of Cambridge gathered to view their fallen landmark. Someone opined in the Cambridge Chronicle that the patriotic tree might have been felled by communists. <laughs> the city cleared away the fallen branches and trunk. Local boys scrabbled for souvenirs. Harvard professor Irving, Irving W. Bailey, an expert on plant anatomy, examined the trunk, and he concluded that the tree had been 204 to 210 years old, meaning it had started growing in the early 
So, so much for the 19th century author's law on how the elm had been standing drier <laughs> before the British settlers arrived in Massachusetts Bay. In November, J. Gardner Bartlett published a letter in the Cambridge Tribune which pointed out that the elm had stood in a pretty regular line with five other elms, including the Whitefield elm. Bartlett theorized that colonial farmers had planted that line of trees to provide shade for the common, to provide shade for their livestock in that space. In other words, those elms were never part of a natural forest. They were always part of people, agriculturalists, reshaping the natural landscape for their use. Of course, the legend of the Washington elm was still in lots of textbooks and history books and in American memories. It still carried symbolic weight. The Cambridge historian Samuel Batchelder had started to chop away at those beliefs, first in his letters to the Tribune, then in a 1925 pamphlet titled The Washington Elm Tradition, Is It True? Then in a Cambridge Historical Society's journal, he was president of the Historical Society, and finally in his book Bits of Cambridge History. Batchelder echoed Martin's life of Artemis Ward, but he pounded the points home, and he didn't leave them in a footnote. He made them the center of his argument, and he is, was especially deft with the sarcasm. If I point out to my little boy a crack in the flo parlor floor where I once lost a quarter, my descendants will doubtless in time show each other the very room where great-grandfather was declared a bankrupt. But it will be the same parlor. <laughs> Those efforts at debunking what had become an American myth prompted a response from in the Chronicles of Oklahoma from editor Joseph B. Thoburn. Thoburn called Batchelder's essay a laborious attempt to prove that the popular tradition concerning the proximity of George, General Washington and the army to the noted old tree is without foundation, in fact. Numerous authorities are cited, not because any of them show, throw any real light upon the subject, but seemingly because none of them even mention it. Of course, that was Batchelder's point. <laughs> a, to state that a historical event occurred, we need sources to mention it. <coughs> Thorburn saw that approach exploding commonly tra accepted traditions and resolving popular myths into their elemental gases seems to be a favorite pastime of some historical writers <laughs> who manifest as much zeal, display as much erudition, and use as much space in print as if engaged on some really constructive historical composition. The Oklahoman didn't offer any evidence to contradict Batchelder's argument. He didn't point any weakness in the analysis. He was just bothered by the conclusion. More bothered by having to change his conception, which he'd probably grown up with, of a moment in July 1775 than in how stacks of school textbooks, tourist guidebooks, histories, biographies, and even horticultural catalogs had devoted pages to retelling the story of the Washington Elm without a good factual basis. Now, Batchelder, as I said, he was an officer of the Cambridge Historical Society. His essay had a big effect locally. People stopped talking about the Washington Elm in quite the same way. But the Washington Elm lived on elsewhere. It wasn't just in Cambridge anymore. It wasn't just in books. It had descendants in seedlings. Descendants of the Washington Elm had been planted in many other places, such as Trenton, New Jersey, Carson City, Nevada, Crater Lake, Oregon, Los Angeles. San Francisco, Oklahoma City. Many of those trees had plaques placed next to them, retelling the story of how this tree was descended from the Washington, or maybe descended from a tree that was descended from the Washington Elm, how General Washington had taken uh, uh, command of the Continental Army under an ancestor of that tree. And of course, the plaques, being metal, outlasted the trees. <laughs> a lot of the wood trimmed from the trees over the years was turned into souvenirs. Uh, some pieces uh, were just chunks, and others uh, were made into objects, like the Longfellow's Cup. Even today, at least one craftsperson on Etsy is offering a folding knife <laughs> and jewelry inlaid with little discs of the Washington Elm, taken from one of those chunks. Uh, Cambridge distributed those chunks uh, in, 17, in 1924 with little plaques on them, as you'll see on the, the big chunk over here. So uh, they are easily traceable. One particularly popular object to make from the tree <laughs> was gavels. As early as 1899, the Grand Lodge of Massachusetts Masons received a gavel with its head made from the Washington Elm. Shortly after the tree fell, Alice Longfellow gave a gavel made from its tree to the Mount Vernon Ladies Association. Other gavels went to the Henry Ford Museum, the Carpenters Country Co Company in Philadelphia, to George 
Manhattan to dozens of state houses around the US. I think it's significant that gavels are used to bring things to order. That was part of the idea that the Washington Elm symbolized. Then there were also non-wooden souvenirs. If you couldn't get a hold of the, uh, there's limited supply of the wood, but you could get tableware. Some of this was manufactured in other countries for the American market. So, I mean, the, the uh, plate on the uh, bottom left there is German, but it's so totally patriotically American because it has the Washington Elm on it. Even the phrase Washington Elm retained a little resonance. The online student newspaper at Washington Co College in Maryland is named the Elm. <laughs> Now, Cambridge couldn't preserve the old tree, but it could preserve its memory. And at first, that spot in the road was paved, but in 1926, the city council voted to place a marble marker on the spot where the tree had stood, but flush with the pavement, because it was in the middle of the street now. And the original marker has been replaced as well. Uh, it's not easy to examine. I would not recommend actually going out and seeing it, because it's in the middle of a very busy street. <laughs> And a horticulturalist at the University of Washington cultivated a seedling from the, that university's offshoot of the Washington Elm and sent it back east and was replanted safely on Cambridge Common in 1931. Although that tree has had to be periodically replaced since because you know, the 20th century was not good to elms. And as I understand it, the elm that is now standing on the common at that spot was grown from an elm that was grown from another elm that stood in another place in Cambridge when Washington was in town. So, so is that tree descended from the Washington elm or not? No. <laughs> but it's descended from the tree that here. knew the Washington elm. They, were friends. they, were, they knew each other as fellow elms in 70 <laughs> In 1949, Cambridge added a bronze plaque or relief statue to that part of the common, showing Washington on horseback reviewing ranks of troops, a very traditional image. The sculptor was Leonard Crask, who also created the Gloucester Fisherman's Memorial. Mm -hmm. The Cambridge Historical Commission spent a lot of time determining the correct, accurate wording for that plaque, reflecting mm -hmm. both the tradition of the Washington Elm, but actually what could be documented, because this was, this was Batchelder's influence. And in the end, the brass letters say, General George Washington, having taken command of the army of the United Colonies at Cambridge, inspects the troops near this spot on the fourth day of July, 1775. Having taken command separates this scene from the earlier moment in July, on July 2nd when General Artemis Ward handed over his authority. The plaque says Washington inspects his troops on July 4th. We know from General Nathaniel Green's letter that on that day, Washington did have a chance to look at some Rhode Island troops. He may well have done so on Cambridge Common. He may have inspected other troops there. It was a natural, there were troops in the, in the Harvard Yard and other buildings around there. It would have been a natural place to get them all to line up. But the new plaque is careful not to say that he inspected all the troops or that he did it on July 3rd, those traditional thoughts. He, they even, the plaque even says near this spot. So that's vague enough to apply to the whole common or even Harvard Yard nearby or even anywhere in town, really, it's near this spot. And yet, Kraft's plaque shows Washington under a big old elm tree. Furthermore, the earlier slab of granite stating the traditional tale remains on Cambridge Common because it has some historic value itself. It was, after all, mm -hmm. uh, it's about over 150 years old. It was possibly created by Longfellow. Many people came to look at it. And of course, right between these uh, objects is an elm tree. As a result, tourists come and photograph that replacement elm as historically important, even though many have probably read in their tour books that actually we don't know. It's, it, this is a legend. Uh, it's, uh, it can't be documented. This isn't the real tree. But take a photo anyway. Take a selfie. In fact, I think by some thinking, seeing value in a historic story which can't be proved, or which even you have reason to believe is false, but you believe anyway, is one way that cultural groups can define themselves, can uh, define themselves as a nation or a religion or some other group. Undeniably, the Washington Elm myth still has power in our culture. Just last month, a chunk of the elm, three inches by six inches, so about the size of an index card, with a plaque attached, one of the Cambridge plaques, 
sold through Bonham's auction house for $4,864. Wow. And that was well above estimate. So even the expert appraisers are surprised by the power, the draw, the attraction of the Washington Elf. So that's the story of the rise and fall and lingering afterlife of the Washington Elm legend. What significance does that story hold now that most people who do the reading no longer accept the tradition? <laughs> Are all those scraps of wood like religious icons, their meaning depending entirely on people's faith or idolatry? What does it mean for a 100-year uh, patriotic tradition turned out to be built on a foundation of sand? All along, were we just propping up a dead tree? <laughs> well, I want to tell a larger story of the big elm beside King Drink Common. That tree did stand in the center of town for about 200 years. It was part of the landscape of the common, laid out for the benefit of the community, and mapped here by a Harvard student during the Revolutionary War. That elm was near nearby when the Reverend George Whitefield preached outdoors a moment in what a later century could dub the first Great Awakening. It was there from 1769 to 1772 when two royal governors insisted that the Massachusetts legislature meet in Cambridge instead of Boston, and the legislature spent a lot of its time protesting that decision. It was there when the rebellious Massachusetts Provincial Congress had a short session in the Cambridge Meeting House. It was the elm was standing when Colonel Percy passed through central Cambridge with his redcoats to reinforce the troops out at Lexington and Concord on April 19, 1775. It was there when provincial troops assembled to march to Charlestown and fortify the crest of Breed's Hill on June 16. It was there on September 8th when volunteers gathered on the common to start their march through Maine to Quebec under Colonel Benedict Arnold. And I think the most important revolutionary event that the Well Elm witnessed is what historians have dubbed the powder alarm of September 2nd, 1774, 250 years ago this year. On that day, up to 5,000 Massachusetts men were reported to have marched on the Cambridge Common from the west, passing that elm tree. Alarmed by the British Army seizing militia gunpowder and ordnance, and rumors, false rumors of an attack on Boston, those men demanded that all the newly appointed uh, councillors in Cambridge resigned their seats. They demanded the royal county sheriff promise not to assist the royal governor in further disarming the militia. They marched along this street out to what is now Elmwood and demanded the man who owned that house, the lieutenant governor, resign from the council as well. Leading politicians came out in the middle of the day from Boston and asked those men to remain calm, which they already were. They were already uh, showing almost military discipline as they waited to hear these men apologize. The leaders of uh, the, the men chose their own leaders, the leaders from Boston, Charlestown, and Cambridge. Uh, they went into a nearby tavern to figure out what to do. And so thousands of ordinary men stood and sat on the common, maintaining their discipline and their unity under its shade trees. That was when the Washington Elm, or that the old elm, uh, was having a direct effect on the revolution. This was the revolution out of doors, with the people uniting in to ban changes from their governors and their social superiors. The genteel patriots were worried that the people would go too far, but that crowd was orderly enough to choose committees, to take votes. There were some close calls on that day. It came close to violence, but no one was killed or injured, so we don't remember it the way we remember the battles of 1775. But by the end of that day, September 2nd, 1774, those thousands of men had made clear that the revolution in Massachusetts government was already underway. The royal government no longer had any authority in the province of Massachusetts beyond the range of its soldiers' guns. Outside of Boston, the only government from now on would be elected. That's a very different story from the tale of a wealthy Virginia planter coming to tame those militiamen, the incarnate discipline that was to free with iron curb that armed democracy. Authors and artists portraying Washington as bringing order out of chaos. Well, that's rather like a judge banging his gavel. But the powder alarm and the gathering of the New England army and the long complicated debates on the, about constitutions, those actions brought, really brought about the new Republican order. And what if instead of calling this tree the Washington Elm, and then being embarrassed, it turns out that there's no strong evidence linking it to Washington, 
our culture had called it the revolutionary elm. And in that case, the story of the elm might have survived debunking, even if it didn't survive 200 years of traffic. Thank you. <laughs> I'm happy to uh, take any questions or comments, uh, uh, or uh, uh, people's own experiences with the elm. Uh, because I didn't draw up here, but uh, yes. Well, this isn't it, it's indirectly about the elm, but you know, we have these these legends like about the elm and Plymouth Rock and various other legends. The Church about of the Nativity. New England history. Um, do you know of any? of these legends that were real? <laughs> um, yes, yes. I mean, or, uh, you, can, you can trace some back. One, one of my favorites, there's a, um, there are a lot of stories about Paul Revere's ride, uh, which, of course, the Paul Revere's ride and Willie Dog's ride and Dr. Shannon Prescott's ride and lots of other people's rides and so on. And, um, uh, of course, Longfellow is uh, directly responsible for boiling it all down to one man. Uh, there was a story... After Longfellow's poem became famous, the Dawes family got sort of upset that they were left out. They actually wrote, uh, and, and there's a letter from Longfellow saying, you know, how, <laughs> I couldn't include him, I'm sorry. But, uh, but, um, uh, and they preserved stories that they had heard from uh, William Dawes, who had, you know, was long dead by then. So these were stories that had been passed down in family tradition. And one of them was that as he was riding away from the British soldiers in what is now Lincoln uh, to escape, he rode into a sort of courtyard of a house and yelled, I've got two of them for you. And the soldiers, the officers behind him thought, uh oh, this is an ambush and pulled back. And it's a great story. It's, you know, it's a sort of like Bugs Bunny trickster tale. <laughs> and, I, and I thought, well, you know, that's just the sort of story grandpa would tell. And, uh, the family would all go on believing. And yet that story appears in the newspapers in 1775. So if William Dawes was making it up, he made it up very early. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh, thanks for a fascinating presentation. Uh, several years ago, I gave a talk on um, inaccurate statues and memorials. And I called the paper Monumental Errors. Um, and uh, I focused on four sites here in Cambridge, one of which was the Washington Elm. So uh, I'll share one of my conclusions with you and invite you to comment, which mm -hmm. is that uh, it matters where these monuments or memorials are. If they're on private land, like the John Harvard statue, Harvard can thumb its nose at people who criticize it as the statue of three lies. Um, but uh, when they're on private public property, like a national park site, for Cambridge Common, then the proprietors, I think, have some responsibility to be sensitive to public opinion if people want to correct or remove inaccurate information. Um, uh, and then, then the, uh, the fourth one was the oddity a few hundred yards west of here, the so-called memorial to Leif Erikson's house, <laughs> which is actually a memorial to one man's absurd fantasy. But mm -hmm. what do you think? <laughs> um, well, I think that you are Correct that uh, a, a public uh, monument is treated differently from uh, a private one. And so I don't know who owns the land, for the land but yeah. Mr. Horsford you certainly know, owned yeah. it at the time, and he had enough money that he could you know, put up a whole tower out in Norna Vega uh, for his, as you say, his, his uh, hobby horse of bringing the Norsemen down to New England. Um, uh, at the same time that the uh, that we might think that public authorities would have a greater responsibility to be accurate, they are actually under more pressure to satisfy the public. And if the public is demanding a tree, then Cambridge goes and replants a tree. <laughs> and so it's, it is a balancing act. I think that uh, we are very fortunate that the National Park Service has, as part of its mission, accurate history. And so it is taking the lead on being accurate even when it is not necessarily popular. Uh, and not every uh, form of level of government, not every government agency, uh, necessarily uh, has that mandate. Uh, we can always, you know, it's, it's, 
awfully easy to try to be uh, popular with the public when the public is paying your salary. Yeah, Joe. Do you know that fake diary from 1876? Yes. <laughs> and everyone thought it was real, and even even till recent years, and it had a d detail that soldier meeting Washington, and it was in great detail, but it was this, taken this as the, true, a true, true, true diary. The Dorothy Dudley diary, yes, I think is what you're right. talking about. And yes, this was published in 1876 uh, in a collection of material from Cambridge, and it's, uh, it's a very lively supposed diary of a young girl uh, or a teenager living in Cambridge through this time. And even though it was... There were hints in that original initial publication that it was fictional. People got fooled by it. And so within a generation or two, people were citing this diary as if it were real. And the Washington Elm was one of the many traditions that she that the, the Dorothy Dudley wrote about. Uh, and uh, there was another case as well. Um, Samuel Batchelor was uh, looking for the source of a diary that I think was published in a Boston newspaper. And he was he spent, I think, years trying to find out, and it was something to do with uh, with Christchurch. And then he finally discovered that his own aunt had written it. <laughs> he was so annoyed. <laughs> I, I, I wonder if there was a little craze around the time of the centennial for young women to write fake diaries, yeah, that was long fictional long diaries, because I mean, it, was, it was American fan fiction. Alice Longfellow was involved in this diary getting it published. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a mm -hmm. story behind women in Cambridge getting this published. Getting it re republished after, say, 1876? I mean, because I know it was, it was republished, and it was, I mean, yeah. that was the sort of thing yeah. that um, yeah. people were finding all sorts of sources at that time in those, in those eras, and, and some of them were real. So you could believe. Uh, that there was this diary uh, that nobody had seen before, and isn't it wonderful? And it doesn't it confirm all our our images of Washington? Uh, I I mentioned a clergyman who talked about Washington uh, taking command of an army of seventeen thousand. Well, that was in another fake source, which was said to be a diary of a chaplain, and nobody has ever found the original, and it doesn't match up with other sources and things like that. So, it, 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 where was this? late, uh, this colonial revival craze of people creating diaries, I think in the Dorothy Dudley case there are enough hints that it was presented at first as fictional. It just wasn't, you know, stamped in big red letters fictional enough that people remembered it. Um, and we can't look back and say, oh, those people were so, so silly, because um, in the 90s, Scholastic uh, publisher put out a bunch of uh, diaries, um, children's uh, books in the form of children's diaries mostly girls, some boys, and uh, they were very lovely pieces of book art uh, made to look like uh, real diaries, and uh, those have been also cited mm -hmm. as real, with people not realizing that, no, this is not right. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a book by Eric Sloan, the Connecticut artist and collector, uh, expert on tool making, expert on all sorts of things. He, has, he put out a diary of a farm boy, Nobody has ever found the original of that, uh, <laughs> and yet it is uh, treated as if it were a historical art artifact. It's it's something which is people are tempted to do <coughs> and people are tempted to believe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, at some point, you mentioned you or you showed a, a, a monument to the Fourth Meeting House. Yes. And uh, it was right after Daniel Waldo. Okay. Or something. I'm trying to remember. Where does that fit in? I just, I didn't quite. Okay, I, I showed that with Edward Everett when he was, because that was where he gave his 1826 uh, okay. talk about the, um, uh, about where he first mentioned the elm. This is, as far as I can tell, the first mention in print of the elm. Okay. Um, if you ask me where that, uh, that stone is, I can't tell you. Yeah. Um, I found the picture on the internet. It oh, is, okay. I know that the, the, <laughs> the, the first, uh, the meeting <coughs> house that was there when Washington uh, arrived is not in the place where First Parish is now, right. across no, the street. The first one, was, first one was down on Dunster Street. And then I think the next three were in the yard. Yes. And then the fifth is right on Mass Ave. Or right, Dunster. and so it was across Mass Ave, and it's probably, there's, um, when you have something like, <laughs> Uh, the tree. Uh, there are 
there are places like Harvard Yard, or sorry, Harvard Square, or um, State Street in Boston, where the traffic is so important that it causes the monuments to be moved around. Right. So that the, the stones that are show where the Boston ma Massacre took place are no longer where they were, they were originally laid down. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure that stone has had to be moved as, uh, as uh, Harvard Square has grown and become more important. But it's still, as, as the, as the uh, copper flag, the bronze plaque says, near this spot. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Go on. Um, well, you didn't mention the big helm cookie that the city of Cambridge gave. To Mount Vernon. I, I surely so, should remember cookies. <laughs> are, are you, is this an actual cookie or is this a the, piece of the a slice? When they okay. do a slice of the main trunk to count the tree rings. Okay. Uh, so that, I guess it's still in one of the side exhibits at Mount Vernon because it was given to them from Massachusetts. And, um, so I thought that would have been in your show. I, I did not know about that. I have not seen that. So, I, think, um, I don't remember exactly, but I think the story was that the city of Cambridge gave it to Sargent, and he was like, wow, this is great. Uh, I don't want this. And so he, <laughs> he gave it to the Mount Vernon lady. To, to Mount Vernon? Um, there also, are, Alice did yep. uh, give them a sapling tree, and it was planted in a prominent place with not enough light and not enough water, and it didn't survive. But other people did plant elm trees. It was the thing to donate trees to try to help them out. Yes, and so, uh, and as I said, Alice donated a gavel, and so there are right. there are parts there, the bits of the Washington elm at Mount Vernon as elsewhere. I mean, I think probably if you go to most of the state capitals in the U.S., somewhere in their storage is probably a gavel from the Washington Elm because I think they, they made a concerted effort to send out uh, those souvenirs to all 48 states at the time. Um, it's, it was you know, a very big deal. Uh, Mike. Yeah, um, could you talk a little bit about the um, tradition of planting elms wherever Washington went, or was that another Bugs Bunny story? <laughs> um, there is, when, when, if you look up the Washington elm, you see that there is actually another tree that was called the Washington elm. It was planted, uh, it, or it stood, I think, near the White House. And it was said to have been planted by Washington himself mm -hmm. when the uh, District of Columbia was being laid out. And theres I don't think there's any good evidence of that. No, it was uh, on Washington Street. It was so on Washington. They well, they would Washington. named it after Washington. Um, it fell over during the Truman administration. Uh, so it got a lot of coverage at the time. So there are, in fact, two uh, trees called the Washington Elm. And then there are all these descendants of one or the other, especially the one here, which are also called like our Washington Elm the one we have in San Francisco in Presidio or something like that. So, uh, but I have not heard the tradition that either that the people, that people tried to plant elms wherever Washington went, or that he planted elms. No, I, I heard it was after, um, his, I think in the early 1800s. Mm -hmm. um, well, there is, it would not, it would not surprise me at happening in the colonial revival. There is, uh, rather early on, there was a book published of tracing Washington day by day. Right. And you don't do that for most people. <laughs> that shows the, you know, his place in American culture. And so it would have been possible to go to all these places. And if you had enough seedlings uh, and, and shoots to plant an elm tree everywhere, I haven't heard about yeah. that. Uh, like wherever there's a Washington Street or, you know, there was like a Johnny Appleseed who went around. And <laughs> <laughs> the, Forest the Forest Service was the Forest Service. The Forest Service was Appleseed. working with crop appeals of elms that are disease resistant in the 80s, I believe, maybe earlier. And so they named them some of them, um, you know, patriotic names. And there was a Washington elm, and and a Jefferson elm, and a Patriot elm. So. Um, I think they stopped selling them locally and they named the new crop something different because they were worried about being confused with the Cambridge Common Washington Elm. So it became problematic. But they, so there's yet another type of Washington Elm those, those in the right, 80s. Those right. were the ones planted in Right, in we, the had, yard, we had one here that yeah. was removed. Yeah. It was purchased from Sylvan Nursery, but it was 
named Washington Owl. It has and nothing to do with the genetic variety in the Cambridge Common. It's just the name they gave the successful hardy tree that had the right shape. Mm -hmm. And I believe some of the others that Lincoln. had been part were, were Jefferson Elms. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think Tom. we have two more questions yep. here in the front. Just a, a quick one. So there is a descendant of the Washington Elm on the property here at a lot of us, is that what I There was. I think mean, Henry, Henry okay. planted one in 1871 or so, but uh, probably did not survive. I mean, I'm just wondering why I hadn't heard of it. Okay, yeah. that explains it. Um, it. It would have been nice, but you know, as I said, the 20th century was not good for elms in general. Uh, so that is why there was this propagation uh, effort for Denver Federal. Yes, you, you've been patient. What about that spreading chestnut tree? <laughs> <laughs> another tree. And another part of uh, Longfellow's celebration of a certain banished, not exactly rural, because he was talking about a blacksmith, uh, but a, a, an old fashioned way of life uh, with the, the, black, the village blacksmith, who was actually, of course, at, by that point, a, uh, a, 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 a workshop manager in a city. <laughs> Um, as I understand it, that tree fell, and the children, uh, somebody in the house can, the children of Cambridge paid to have the pieces of the chestnut tree made into a chair, which is inside the house in oh. honor of At Lowen Blacksmith Longfellow. House? No, inside this house. This house? <laughs> yes. Uh, the Blacksmith House, of course, belongs to the Cambridge Center for Adult Education, but because Longfellow made the uh, blacksmith oh, famous. Oh, yeah. They made the, tree, the chair for uh, Professor Longfellow. <laughs> and so and that can be seen on tours when the house reopens for uh, visitors in there. Come back for more tree debunking things. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to um, wrap questions here. I think I want to make sure that folks have a couple of minutes to take a look up close at these yeah. samples of whatever we now think they are. I, I think um, they are Washington Elms. <laughs> well, they, they, are, they are, no doubt, especially the big one, uh, bits of what was called the Washington yeah. Elm. Now that you've dashed the story. Exactly. I do not know if Washington <laughs> took his sword, unheeded his sword underneath that tree. He was certainly within the realm of that tree. When he moved from the Wadsworth House near Harvard Yard to here, he may have passed by that tree. Uh, Possibly not um, spending one second looking at it <laughs> because it was a tree. Uh, but this is uh, a uh, bit of a tree that is famous for being famous. Yeah. Well, thank you <laughs> so much to John. Um, before folks disperse, I just want to say another thank you to the friends of the Longfellow House Washington's headquarters for making this lecture possible every year. Um, there is information about the friends of the Longfellow House on the back table with these little cards if anyone would like to connect further. Otherwise, once again, thank you so much for coming. Thanks to the friends. Thanks especially to Joan Bell. Um, and we hope to see you again soon. Yeah, they're coming back. If Jefferson. I